I, I want to jump in and maybe challenge, maybe not. Uh, one thing you said there was um, that the human brain has evolved to, to reproduce its own niche. Um, I've been reading a lot um, of discourse about sort of queer nature and that and that world of, of um, creativity. And, and one of the arguments there is that the brain does a lot of stuff just because it likes it. It's, it's curious and it's it likes art and it likes aesthetics and and not everything is, is reproduced. It's sort of a, you know, I think AI will always struggle to, to have that weirdness, that that sort of kookiness right yeah exactly that yeah i mean yeah i couldn't have put that better myself that's that's the, yeah that's exactly right i mean yeah just the randomness of uh, and the kookiness of, of of so many thoughts i mean just i mean we you know we we have these networks in our brain like the default network for instance which um, activates when we rest when we think we're doing nothing and that's when your creativity uh, most most comes alive and so many amazing discoveries have been made by you know, people just, you know, off doing nothing and resting and, and it's, it's, it, that's something that's a kind of sort of neural magic to, for, for want of a better word, that uh, an AI system, you know, will only, will only churn out if you give it the instruction, instruction to churn out. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, the kookiness and the randomness, again, which could only come from an incredibly complex 7 million year natural history where we've merged with bacteria and viruses and microbiomes and you know just a long messy biological process over all of that time that's going to give us something much more unique um that you know than than uh, i think ai could but you know i mean again it's it's like a rapidly evolving development um but yeah i think yeah i mean I think people are a bit, yeah, I think, we, again, I, I, I just think mm -hmm. it's overhyped. Yes, me too. Um, and also dangerous in ways that we, we can't predict. Um, you said a word there, and uh, you said the word magic. And Lauren has just uh, left a comment that says, magic mushrooms and the brain, um, which I assume is a question. Um, but, you know, we're having David Nutt, President Nutt on the program in a couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, and you mentioned magic mushrooms, uh, psilocybin and, and psychedelics a little bit, the stoned ape theory classic. Um, could you just dig into that a little bit um, and, uh, and explain what you find interesting about it? Yeah, it's a really interesting theory. Um, so I touched on it briefly in the book because I thought it, 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 deserves, it deserves a mention and a, and a discussion. Um, I mean, very briefly, the, the idea is, is that uh, early humans will have, um, would have no doubt eaten lots of magic mushrooms and... Um, um, we, there's evidence for this in the fossil record. You can see like the spores of mushrooms in like in like teeth. And we know that lots of ancient cultures, um, uh, you know, used various different narcotics. And we know that when you delve into the chemistry of magic mushrooms, they contain psilocybin, which is this uh, psychoactive uh, psychoactive substance. And that does really amazing things for the brain for brain chemistry. Uh, you know, first of all, it increases the connection between brain cells. But it also increases what we call edge perception, which is the ability to like detect objects in space. And so the idea is, the theory is that this would have made humans much better hunters, much like quicker to see like an ambush and or much quicker to ambush ambush uh, that you know prey and things like that. Um, and I mean, again, because of the effects of psilocybin on our neurochemistry. I think it's a theory that should be kept alive and we should keep exploring it, but more importantly, we should keep exploring the effects of psilocybin on the brain um, and exactly exactly what's going on there. Um, which is why, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of David Nutt and his work and figuring out, you know, I mean, we, there's so much to learn about the brain. That there are so many things that we can unlock by using these substances. Um, which have been very narrow-mindedly sort of blocked from from you know from us doing that uh, and you know so yeah I yeah it, yeah it doesn't make me want to go and uh, you know, grab a load of magic mushrooms myself <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, yeah it's a really interesting idea of the stone date theory for for anyone who doesn't know about David Nutt he was the man who was hired by the new Labour government to study magic mushrooms and all forms of drugs came back and he produced some results that they didn't like and so they fired him um because he basically said that uh, things like alcohol and smoking are much worse than psilocybin and, uh, and LSD um, and advocated for their um legalization um so on practical stuff we have Ngozi and Brigida um who ask 
Um, so Nguzi says, uh, thanks, I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, you mentioned that our brains offer limitless, limitless opportunities. Are there any newly discovered or best practices in terms of a practical side that people can change their brains? And Brigida says, uh, I am an occupational therapist working with health colleagues. Uh, what's the best way to learn a skill? So have you learned anything practical from your, from your deep dive into the brain? Yeah, um, so practical in terms of just improving. In terms of like learning, in terms of positive changes, habits, things like that. Yeah, well, I suppose, I mean, the, so the first thing to say would be like, just like the common sense stuff in terms of having like a Mediterranean diet, for instance, is known to be very good for the brain. Um, really good heart health is known to be good to the, for the brain. So like, uh, you know, so many types of dementia and other, other uh, brain disorders, there's often, they often find a link um, between poor poor heart health uh, as well um, so keeping the heart healthy um, sleep as well I would say is like one of the most fundamentally important things for a healthy brain um, so we know that when when you sleep your brain essentially cleans itself it actually has a kind of rinse cycle um, where you have sort of a vat of cerebral spinal fluid and that washes over your brain and it clears away all the toxins that that will could uh, well that many build up into to uh lead to many uh, neurodegenerative diseases so getting lots of sleep exercising mediterranean diet um things like meditation as well um and just and just rest uh, so i mean I'm, I'm writing my third book at the moment about rest actually and the neuroscience of rest and why we all need to do a lot more of it <laughs> um, and it's uh yeah it, there are so many things that, that come to life in the brain when you think you're doing nothing. Um, I mentioned one earlier, the default network. And we know that when these networks come, come to life, when we're doing nothing, things like creativity improve, problem solving, intelligence, emotional processing. Um, and it's the thing that's interesting about that is that you're not focused on a task. So weirdly, when you're focused on a task really intently, um, that's when your default network isn't activated and uh, it's when all of the the the, the benefits of, of of activating the default network are, are, are not are not going on. So we basically we need to sort of flip this idea on its head that you know that resting and doing nothing uh, is exactly that. It's not. It's a very active process. Um, it's actually work and overwork where your brain is not doing anything. <laughs> paradoxically, the um, number of creative people who say that you know you do work and then you go for a walk and that's when you have the moment of inspiration. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, long walks. I've been trying to, yeah, trying to do lots of those recently myself. Long baths as well. There's some really interesting research showing how, how, how long baths can improve, improve cognitive function. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah, the common sense stuff, but then also the stuff that you like have guilty pleasures for. Um, that's often like actually quite good for your brain. So. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you mentioned um, in relation to dementia and Alzheimer's in, in the book um, links to something that Lainey's asked about, which is language. Um, if, you know, if you learn a language, if you're, if you're active in that part of your brain. Um, and uh, Lainey says, is there any indication of the evolution growth of the brain to suggest when and how the evolution of language may have occurred? Um, is it important to mm -hmm. our brain? Yeah, so language is, language is an interesting one because language is one of the few things in our, in our minds, in our brains that um, is almost totally socially constructed, right? Because, um, you know, we can all learn different languages and different languages have cropped up across the world because of the, the hist for historical and, and social reasons. Um, but, but at the same time, even though language is, uh, you know, a purely cultural, social thing, we have to have the neurobiological hardware to, uh, to, to understand language. Um, so, Again, this is something that like language is another kind of sort of holy grail of neuroscience. Like so it's not, we don't understand that much about it. We know that there are like two areas, uh, Broca's area and Wernick's area. And these areas are responsible for like the production of language, but also the comprehension of language. So you can have someone like, you know, with, uh, with, with Broca's aphasia and they, they struggle to actually um, produce speech and Wernick's aphasia, they struggle to understand speech. I think I've got that the right way around. Um, but then beyond that, again, like it will be to do with like the expansion of the, 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 the neocortex over mm -hmm. time. They've identified like a few genes. I think the FOXP2 gene is one that is supposed to be quite integral to language. Um, but yeah, beyond, it's a really difficult one because so many of these regions are obviously overlap with other things, with other functions. And so much of language development and evolution will come from that social and cultural background 
I mean, I think I mentioned in the book that, you know, early humans, there's this idea that early humans started gesturing and then going on to babbling. And then, you know, you had Homo erectus uh, traveling, you know, via, via raft to, to explore new lands. And they would have had to have had some, some sort of very basic language to say, you know, paddle here, paddle there, you know, do, you know, push here, pull there sort of thing. Um, and so, again, it seems like, and this idea is called the, the sign progression theory of language, that, that, that it sort of gradually grew from like, uh, you know, first you had a footprint, and then you had a symbol of that footprint, and then you had some sort of icon of the footprint, and then a babble of the, what the footprint is. And then over time, that would have then branched out into the 7,000 languages that we have that we have today. Although I think in the grand history, it's, 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 it's a heck of a lot more than that. Um, so, but in terms, yeah, so I suppose that's the anthropological hi human history side of it. But in terms of the brain, again, apart from those areas I mentioned in the neocortex, we're still figuring out exactly how the brain uh, encodes and performs language, you know, and, and you know, why apes, why, why other apes can't, can't speak and things like that. So oh, it's completely tantalizing. And what I wouldn't give to hear that babble. <laughs> uh, you know, Homo erectus on a raft. That's, that's, that's the time machine answer, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, one, more, one more question for me that, um, that links to something that David asks. Um, David says, do you think our evolved brains makes us less aligned with nature, with poor external senses, with less understanding of our natural environment, um, e.g. animals have more developed senses? And just more generally, it's a big discourse in climate activism i think there was a time article a few years ago that was like why your brain can't process climate change um and i also remember seeing earlier this year the idea that the that, that places that have had rapid climate change the brain development is actually changed in, in in fetuses and things so basically how how do you see the challenge of of climate change the challenge of connecting with nature and our brains are, are we wired to connect to nature is there something that prevents us from understanding the the, the, the difficulties there what, what do you mm. take on that yeah that's that's a really good question um that's a very that's a that's a tough question that's a very yeah, just very... fix climate change for us please joe uh in, <laughs> exactly. in five minutes i i feel like um so i suppose what the first part of the question is uh, that the human brain development has sort of put put us sort of out of sync with with nature and our respect for nature so i mean i wouldn't necessarily put that put it down to human brain evolution I'd put it down more to the way our societies have developed, uh, especially in the West, uh, especially after the Industrial Revolution. Um, and this idea of just constant growth, and that inevitably will lead to the destruction of, of the environment and nature. Um, and yeah, as, as we all know, we're, we're desperately trying to undo a lot of that damage. Um, and it really is quite alarming. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's difficult for me because I sort of, I, I veer from pessimism to optimism when it comes to climate change. I mean, it's such an enormous challenge. I mean, it is the defining challenge of our time. Um, I feel like understanding brain evolution and understanding how our minds work and how they've, how they've evolved and how they've been an integral part of nature um, can only help in that endeavor. Because again, it just it brings us back to this idea that we are an integral, you know, part of nature. Um, I still think that humans, despite you know Darwin and so much of our education, you know, it, out laying out the wonders of evolution, I still think that we have this idea of you know that famous monkey to man yeah. image, which is really outdated because it basically shows you know you know man being the ultimate, the final thing, and it's just it's not even scientific. I still think we think uh, we think about our place in nature in that way in many ways, and that prevents us from taking the action that we need to take on climate change. So, for me, understanding how the human brain evolved, um, it's just as integral to uh, as just understanding evolution in general, in terms of making us realize, you know, you know, we're a part of nature. Um, there are so many of us, and we've developed such extraordinary intelligence that. I think it's incumbent upon us to be stewards of nature now. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the quicker we can uh, realise that and actually act on it, uh, the better. Um, yeah, that's what I would say about that. What a beautiful answer. And I can agree more in terms of the psychology, not only for 
things like you know climate activism and, and not focusing on despair because we know that the brain kind of sinks when it when it gets gets depressed and, and despair but but also I mean I remember reading a long time ago that um when when you smell fresh soil in some people oxytocin is released um so there's there's all these things that if we if we learn more about the brain um, it can only help yeah yeah that's a that's a really interesting one I didn't know about that one I I know that they think that the color blue changes your neurochemistry and lowers stress levels so like people who live it live by the ocean uh, might have like lower stress levels because they're just seeing blue all the time um but yeah that's uh, that's yeah that's another good one I'll have to I'll look that up <laughs> yeah fascinating well listen Dr Joseph Gibelli thank you so much for a wonderful talk we've had so many brilliant questions thank you audience for those questions and please do go pick up this brilliant book how the mind changed a human history of our evolving brain joe the final word please to you thank you so much again i know just yeah just to say uh to to, to every everyone listening and watching and to you as well luke th thank you so much um for, for for your for your time and for giving me the opportunity to 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 share my thoughts um yeah uh, thank you so much thank you it was a wonderful talk thank you so much bye, -bye.